Welcome to Enroute to Success, where we have raw, vulnerable conversations between Fitz DeSanto, Sam Boyer, and many talented individuals, unraveling the truths and principles of people's experiences, methods to grow, and discovering how to live a fulfilling lifestyle. Buckle up, the journey begins now. Hey, 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 welcome back to our podcast. There goes Sam. How are you, Sam? I'm good, Fitz. How are you today? I am good. Today, I could already feel it. It will be an amazing day because we will be talking about anxiety. We are joined by a really good friend of mine and also been in social services for almost 15 years. So um, her name is Jennifer. Jennifer currently works in the same space as a psychotherapist too marriage and fam- and marriage and family therapy this includes working with children and parents with development developmental disabilities and neurodiversity which is autism adhd and down syndrome and etc so without further ado i'm really excited to welcome my friend here jennifer who's a licensed marriage and family therapist welcome to our podcast jennifer hi thank you for having me i'm really excited to be here and be part of this journey Yes, we really appreciate. Thank you for your time. I know you're busy with what we're going through right now in this unprecedented time. And, and thank you. Thank you for, for having the time to speak with us and share some light to our listeners. Uh, it's my privilege. I appreciate you asking. Yeah. So, I mean, for a very, let's dive into it. You ready, Sam? Let's go. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm a little bit anxious, but I think that's a uh, good thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, so very first question, I mean, we've always asked this, Jennifer, you know, if you could just give us a high overview of your origin, backstory, where Jennifer is from, and how did you get to um, what you do today, and what really inspired you to do that? And I'll, I'll give you the floor to explain that high overview. Sure, I will. I'll try my best to sort of summarize, but um, I will say I've been a lifelong patient as a therapy patient. It started at a fairly young age. You know, my parents were sort of those somewhat progressive parents when they got divorced. They wanted to put me and my brother in therapy to make sure that we were okay. Um, and then, of course, you know, I've been in and out of therapy kind of ever since. I struggled a lot with a pretty severe depression as a teenager. Um, and honestly, I think my therapist was my lifeboat. But I started college as a music major, believe it or not. Mm. And that didn't work out for some medical reasons. And so I kind of thought to myself, well, what else am I going to do with my life if it's not going to be music? Like, what else do I find interesting? And the only other thing that I thought was interesting enough that I could actually pass classes in was psychology. (laughs) (laughs) So that's where my academic journey in psychology really started. Um, I finished college and started working with severely emotionally disturbed children and then transitioned my career into working into the arena with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities. And that's where that background kind of began. One thing led to another and basically a bachelor's level education in psychology just doesn't pay very much. So I knew I was going to have to go get a master's. Um, which is what brought me to California, which is right around when you and I met, as a matter of fact. Wow, that's an interesting one. <laughs> yes. Um, and so that's kind of the, the high arching overview of how I ended up in this field. But the other life raft that carried me through a lot of tough times throughout my life has always been yoga as well. And so while I was getting my master's degree in clinical psychology, and eventually working on my clinical hours as a marriage and family therapist, I also knew I wanted to pursue the path of being a yoga therapist because I knew the healing powers of yoga as well in the realm of holistic mental health care. And so eventually I ended up pursuing that secondary credential as a yoga therapist. And um, now I have what I consider to be a holistic mind-body therapy practice Um, working with people in my own private practice, doing mind-body therapy where I incorporate traditional healing mechanisms from the yoga therapy tradition with the more modern Western psychotherapy combination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
No, that's that's really good. Thank you for that overview. I I'm gonna have to peel that off a little bit, um, <laughs> <laughs> Jen. So um, I think what really struck me is when listening to your story is that prompt of you switching to psychology from music to psychology and also incorporating your yoga therapy. So can you walk us through what's going through your head on, on having that switch and, and what, what happened there? Like what happened in that moment that you decided, okay, I'm going to go to a psychology. Um, I could reach more people. And so, and yeah, let us know. And, and I'd like to hear that um, story behind that. Sure. I mean, honestly, that was one of the, I've had some very challenge, very big challenges in my life. And that was one of the bigger ones I've ever had to face because I was a really talented musician. I was one of those um, musicians that was recruited for college by like 14 or 15. They made a whole special degree program just for me because I was quite good at what I did. And I was very uniquely good at what I did. Um, specializing in the bass clarinet, which is a unique thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so when my hands stopped working, basically, I had, I was really up against a wall because I was never very academically inclined. Um, I didn't much care for school growing up. And I was, my family was very hardcore, like, we don't care what you major in, but you're getting a degree. So figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it really just kind of fell on like, well, what classes could I pass? Honestly, it wasn't anything bigger <laughs> than that at that point in my life. I mm -hmm. was thinking I was probably going to go to esthetician school or maybe become a hairstylist. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that psychology was going to be fairly straightforward for me because that was one thing that made sense. And it was, I ended up excelling in my psychology classes and that kind of, um, reinforced that principle that psychology is something that makes sense in my brain, probably because all of these years of therapy I'd had growing up. Um, and then it, it was another thing of like, okay, and now I'm done with college and I don't want to move home. So how do I get a job that can make enough to pay bills? And it really started at that very primal, like I just need to pay my bills kind of a level. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I started my first job working with these severely emotionally disturbed children in a residential treatment facility. And these are children who have been through the worst kind of things, um, are not safe to live in homes, not even foster homes, are not safe to go to public schools. Um, so there was an in-house school and everything there. And that's where I really started to see I had a very special talent for connecting with people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. And I have to say, being a music major makes sense why you have the rhythm in my spin class and all my classes. Because <laughs> Jennifer is one of the frontliners, you guys. She's right in front. And she can jive, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think the next question that we wanted to ask really is let's dive into the anxiety. So, um, you know, it would be very beneficial for me, Sam, and everybody to really know how does someone know if they're actually having anxiety? I mean, if you could mm. walk us through that actual symptoms when it's finally identified, you know, mm -hmm. what can our listener do to either overcome or deal with that type of anxiety that they are dealing with at that moment? I mean, to some people, do we grab our CBD? <laughs> do, we, do we just identify we're being hypochondriac or just dramatic what's going on with your head you know so um you know it'd be really beneficial if you could walk us through what it actually really means and also what how to deal with it when it finally happens yeah you know that's an interesting question the idea of how to identify anxiety and starting at that just basic level really hmm. um and i've worked with people who when I've explained to them, well, what you're describing to me sounds like anxiety. It's, there's like this aha moment. And so some of the things when I am working with a client and I'm identifying kind of what the situation is going on diagnostically, some of the things that I'm listening for is people describing repetitive or racing thoughts that they don't have control over. 
Um, a lot of times anxiety comes with what we call somatic symptoms, which means physical, like physiological, physical symptoms, like uh, excessive amounts of stomach aches and headaches are really common with anxiety. Um, you'll also hear people saying things like, you know, I just don't sleep well. Um, I feel like I'm worrying all the time about stuff that's totally out of my control. Um, when we move into the real diagnostic categories of mm -hmm. generalized anxiety disorder, you'll also hear things where like, gosh, I worry about things that just don't even make sense. Like I'm up at night worried about these situations and scenarios that are never going to happen, but I can't help myself. I just like, I'm constantly thinking about things that could possibly go wrong. And that's when we look at it as a generalized condition, because they're just generally worrying about all these different things that are out of their control. And there's no ability to really regulate the thoughts. It's what we call almost compulsive thinking. And then sometimes it can move from a generalized anxiety into a, a full-blown panic disorder, mm. which is a more severe experience of having panic attacks. Mm. And that can include things like racing heart, feeling like you can't catch your breath, feeling like you just want to run and scream or like you're frozen and you can't move. Those sorts of things can really be very disturbing experience for some people and will be the reason that a lot of people actually go to the hospital. They might worry that like they're actually having a heart attack or something is really wrong. And so those are, those are all different kinds of anxiety symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes even just hearing them or thinking about them can make you feel a little bit anxious because we can all relate to it. On I'm doing level, it right now. Right? <laughs> right? Me too. I'm like, gosh, even describing it. It's like, oh. Yeah. So you just so did what that are we right doing there. Then? Yeah. You just did that right there. So when, when that happens, what can we tell our listeners to not the diagnostic anxiety, but the day-to-day -day anxiety, how do we how do they deal with that? Or how do I deal with it right now? <laughs> Maybe just too much coffee, but um, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. Yeah, I was just asking, how do we deal with that if whenever that happens and I was just saying that maybe I just had too much coffee. That's why. I'm yeah. Like... And that's exactly, you know, when I work with people who have anxiety conditions, one of the first things I start with is lifestyle. Truly, it's like, let's talk about your lifestyle choices, diet choices, sleep patterns. What are you consuming literally as in your ingesting and visually as in like, what are you looking at in your day to day? And so a lot of things that I'll start off with, with people is like, if you're drinking caffeine, like maybe just don't, if you really need it to get your day started, like have your one cup of coffee in the morning, but just leave it alone after that, you know? anxiety and caffeine are really good friends like they love to party together I wouldn't recommend drinking a lot of caffeine if you struggle with anxiety mm -hmm. yeah. the other things I talk to people a lot in regards to lifestyle is that consumption piece as far as social media goes as far as news media goes you know just observing what are you intaking that could possibly just be basically activating the sympathetic nervous system and that's the thing that we look at from a physiological perspective. So starting with basic lifestyle changes can make a huge shift for some people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Sam, do you have any, I see you wanting to. <laughs> I do. I, I'm going to ask my question and then I'll probably yeah. dive into another one. But so like with all of that, as you're working with people, because it's it's easy for for from your perspective to probably see like all these things in their lifestyle that can really be like big changes that they could make how do you how do you make it like tangible for them so like what goals do you i guess help them set or you know just so they have something to kind of look toward like hey here are some some things that i can work on other than like just stopping drinking caffeine or avoiding social media because like that's so hard for people to just like stop that stuff so what have you seen be effective in in that area 
You know, it is hard, but a lot of times when people come to me, when they make it into my office, they're often feeling so intensely that they're willing to try anything. Mm -hmm. And so I'm never going to tell somebody, you must discontinue this fully right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm all about this gradual process of like, if you're drinking five cups of coffee a day, maybe cut it down to two. If you're spending four hours a day on social media and watching news, like maybe just cut it back again into two or maybe one. There's also things you can add into your life, like exercise, especially right now in the kind of times that we're currently in. Exercise is a really effective way of the body's natural ability to rid any extra neurochemicals in the body and hormones related to stress, such as cortisol and adrenaline. And so adding a little bit of exercise into your day can really help your body to regulate. But for a lot of people, that's just kind of intro to managing anxiety. Like I would say that's anxiety management 101. Mm -hmm. The secondary pieces are about looking at the kind of thoughts that you're having and the story you tell yourself about life and the experiences you're having on a daily basis. And then what we call coping mechanisms and adding tools to your toolkit So that when you are experiencing anxiety, you have something you can do about it. If you haven't had coffee all day and you've been good about your social media intake or the news, you've exercised, that doesn't mean you're going to 100% never experience anxiety again. So we have to add additional tools to our toolkit for self-care and emotion regulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, I have so many so many notes. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> Me too. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna have to. Uh, we might have to have a one-on-one session, Jennifer, so we can organize our stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, so what you're saying, what, what I've gathered is it's it's incremental changes, right? It's almost like in the fitness world when I was in the fitness industry, you can't come to me and tell me you want to lose 50 pounds. Let's get to 10 first or five pounds first, then we keep going, right? So um, what really stuck with me is like on on Sam's follow-up question is does quiet time help anxiety or does it make it worse oh that is such a good question and fair question honestly and I will say it depends yeah (laughs) okay it depends on where you're at with your anxiety and who you are and what you're doing during your quiet time sure I would say like as a core basic as a general yes you know, because it's going to help to lower some of the brain waves that are often really high up and really rapid Mm -hmm. when we're engaged in activity. And we just sit and have some quiet time in a nice bath or in a little meditative space. In theory, that's going to make a lot of people feel better. But if you're like having a panic attack and your anxiety levels are really, really high, quiet time might make that a lot worse. And so that's when we have to also spend time learning how to gauge what sort of state of anxiety we're in. Are we in a state where we really just need some quiet time and that's going to help us feel better? Or are we in a state where we're so hyper agitated that we need to like meet ourselves where we're at and bring ourselves down in a gentle way? Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes it might mean like watching a movie because then from there you've mellowed out enough to maybe go for a walk outdoors. And then from there you've mellowed out enough to just sit and have some quiet space. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good answer. Sam, sorry. I didn't mean to. No, you're good. I'm there. I was just so excited. (laughs) (laughs) I I have just a thought of my own that I want to get your perspective on is like the relationship between anxiety and depression then, because like anxiety is kind of like being hyped up on stimulants all day. And then depression is the, the downer. And I can, I can say from at least, you know, personal experience and then, you know, friends and and family members have gone through similar things. It seems like they both hang out together because you get, you can have so much anxiety that it wears you out. And then by the time end of the day rolls around, then you're just depressed and, and tired and, I just want to hear your thoughts on like how that relationship works and what you've seen for people. Did you hear us, Jennifer? Yeah, I heard him. It just cut out right at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, that is also a really good point, Sam. Depression and anxiety do tend to show up together a lot. And when I'm working with some of my clients, I will educate them about the fact that some people can have just depression all by itself, which is one thing. But some people have what I'll call depression that is born from anxiety, mm -hmm. where their life is just so stressful and so anxious that it depresses them because they can't do anything without being afraid. They can't sleep well. Their stomach bothers them all the time. And they're just so depressed because they're worried constantly. And so a lot of times in those cases, that's when we'll see that when we work with the anxiety that the depression tends to get a lot better because they're just not as worried. They're more comfortable in their physical bodies. They're more comfortable in their space and their mind. And then the depression tends to get a bit better. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Cause I, I didn't want it to make it seem like people maybe thought they weren't related or that there isn't a connection there. So thanks for, for sharing that as well. Yeah, no, that is, that is a good, perspective jennifer and i we're we're enjoying this so much i mean i have so much notes and questions and and one of the things that i want to get into is um can you walk us through how you um bring in yoga therapy with your practice because i think you know tying into our question earlier that the quiet time would help but I think an interactive, like doing yoga, you know, focusing on your breath would really be beneficial for people that wants to improve on what they currently have at this moment. If they're having an, you know, an outburst like of this severe anxiety right away from zero to a hundred, right? So um, if you could walk us through how you, you, I won't say treat it, but really how to um, bring the yoga therapy with your practice? I would love to, because it's one of my favorite tools in my toolkit as a clinician. Um, so to kind of step back a little bit and explain what yoga therapy is compared to yoga. Yoga therapy is where we take yoga interventions and we apply them in a therapeutic context to treat specific conditions. So some people will say, isn't all yoga therapeutic? And like, yes, all yoga is and potentially can be therapeutic, but not all yoga is yoga therapy. So in my training background, we have a whole different skill set about how we can use skills such as asana, which is the postures, pranayama, which is the breath, mantra, which is the repetition of a short phrase or a sentence or a word. Um, sometimes we'll use chanting, meditation and in settings where that's amenable we'll use prayer as well and we can use all of these as a form of treating some kind of a condition and some you know practices that might mean like treating your back pain but I'm a mental health specialist so I use my yoga therapy in a mental health context but if you also have back pain we can work that in there sort of a thing so if we're looking at how I use yoga therapy with anxiety specifically, it might mean, so this is a perfect example of, let's say someone ends their day and they're just so stressed out and so anxious from their work day that we start off with a bit more of a vigorous kind of asana practice with the postures. And we include a breath practice that's incorporated into the postures. So it's a very breath centric practice. And then we work down from there into a seated breath practice where in a lot of my clients have their own specialized, unique breath practice that's for their own specific condition. And then sit and do a meditation or we might sit and do a mantra and chanting. You cut out a little bit. You're frozen right now. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm going to try to move rooms and see. Yeah. Intermission, intermission. Make sure you edit this bit. Make sure you edit it. <laughs> I just let Kelly in because she was. 
she was right outside my door and she was like she, i just let her in he's like okay just stay all right where did i lose you guys um you were talking about sam correct me if i'm wrong the vigorous when someone just came home from work and had a long day yeah and, and you were talking about specific breath work for individual uh clients Yes, right. So we would move from a physical asana practice into a very specific breath practice that's been supported by the asana practice. And so a lot of my clients have their own uniquely developed breath practice that's specifically designed to be done at a specific time of day, um, preferably at least four to seven days a week. With the idea being that this isn't just a daily practice that you're doing like you would brush your teeth but also that it can be a rec rescue intervention. So one of my favorite metaphors, cause I'm a sports fan and I love football. <laughs> it's like, you don't just show up for the Super Bowl, right? Like you don't just show up and play. You spend preseason practicing, you review your old games, you have all this practice. I mean, Sam, I listened to how you grew up in the hockey world. You of all people, fully understand how much work goes into showing up for game day, right? Most definitely. So it's the same way when it comes to mental health management. You don't just show up to a panic attack and expect that that one breath practice your therapist taught you that one time is going to now work amazingly. Mm -hmm. You have to practice it every day so that when game day shows up, you're like, all right, I've practiced these drills. I know what to do. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's... Thank you for taking it. I feel like I'm having a therapy session with Jennifer and I, I, could, I could feel it. I'm already feeling better. <laughs> I'm, I moved my coffee away already. I'm good, you know, like I'm switching to water at this point. Um, so, <laughs> Sam, is, is, do you have any other pressing questions so we could move on to the next if, if you, you know? Well, no, I just, that was such a good analogy, especially with a, a sports background that I didn't know that you were a big football fan. That's, that's really cool because like, there's just so much, like you said, that goes into it and just the little, you know, bits of research and more like amateur practitioner that I am of meditation. I feel that when I am consistent, it's very clear. And yeah. when I'm not consistent, it is also very clear. Yeah. And so you just saying that reinforces everything that, that I've been kind of experiencing myself and, you know, inherently know and learn just based off success principles and sports. But I just really love that you shared it that way. Cause it made it very clear. I literally wrote down, you don't just show up to a panic attack and expect to win after doing one drill. Like that's just going to stick with me. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's really enlightening Jennifer. I have so many notes too. I have to turn a page. Um, <laughs> <laughs> another another question that I have here that I really want to get to, and I know um, with your line of work being in the social services and then with me being in the fitness industry for a while, I know how draining it can be, right? I, like I call it, I'm peopled out, you know, by a certain time, I'm like, I love people, but I just, I need to hug my introvert side, no music, right? Like, <laughs> I just want my quiet time because I want to listen to my thoughts and really calm my, my, my head down. So my question to you, Jennifer, is where does Jennifer get her wisdom and her strength? And I know knowing you, I know the answers, but to all the listeners out there, that is probably in the same line of work, what you do, what can you share to them on how they can recharge of your practice to get your wisdom and also your strength. So by the time you're in front of these people and helping people, you have this light that you are going to share with them. Hmm. That's a very important question. You know, it's important not only for me as a mental health practitioner, it's important for parents, it's important for other types of medical providers, fitness providers. I think now more than ever, a lot of us are starting to realize where our strengths are and where our areas for improvement are in regards to our own boundaries and self-care. And that's the that's really my answer is. I am very meticulous 
about practicing healthy boundaries and self-care. I mean, for example, I start my day two and a half hours before I am in front of a patient. You know, I wake up every day early. I read uh, inspiring material. I do a yoga therapy practice for my own sure. mental health and physical health conditions. I have a full breakfast. And then eventually a couple hours later, I'm sitting in front of what is now a computer screen and doing the work I do. Mm -hmm. I also take time in between each client. Sure. You know, I'm a very, I'm a very spiritual person, as you know. And so I'll take time in between each client to sort of like literally energetically cleanse my space, cleanse myself. If I feel compelled, maybe say a little prayer for the person I just worked with go to the bathroom, make sure I'm drinking plenty of water, mm -hmm. especially now because I'm home, maybe have a little snack, a bite of something in between clients, mm -hmm. just something to really create a, a division between clients so that it doesn't feel like I'm back to back to back to back to back. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm also really, again, meticulous about the boundaries. So that means I absolutely do take a lunch break, you know, and I, when I'm done with my work day, I, as a business owner, I can't just shut off my phone, right? Because I have ethical responsibilities in regards to being somewhat available for clients, but I'm very like careful not to work on my weekends. And I tell my clients, these are my weekends. If you have an emergency, this is what you need to do. I am not available for emergency response as a general rule. I'm a, you know, private practice clinician. I don't have on call hours. That's not what we do if this is how you can take care of yourself but it's important for the work I do to make sure that I'm spending enough time for myself and my own wellness so I can be there for my clients and I make that you know clear that expectation is set up from the beginning mm -hmm. and I really encourage people to do the same thing and I'm in also very intentional about making sure that I engage in meaningful activities outside of my work like, you know, I'm a dancer. I love to yeah. dance. That's actually how Fitz and I met backstory <laughs> we was help. at a gay dance club. And he <laughs> saved me from a creepy straight guy. And <laughs> I've always loved to dance. It has been in my blood since my mother says in utero. And so now I still do dance. I might be a grown adult and I'm not going to pursue a professional career as a dancer, but it doesn't mean I still don't spend my time dancing and doing things I enjoy, going on hikes on the weekend, making sure I'm not filling my weekends to the brim, mm -hmm. you know, that there's plenty of time in between it so that when I do get back to the office on Sunday morning, when my work week starts, I don't feel like, God, where did my whole weekend go? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really about having appropriate balance, managing your boundaries that I'm not constantly responding to emails and voice messages and text messages, which I do get all day, every day, but it's having this like, okay, like I don't, I try not to do any work stuff past 8 PM, mm -hmm. which may sound late even to some people, but it might just be like a text or an email, just knock something out, but I'm done after that, you know? And I certainly don't do work stuff on weekends mm -hmm. unless oh. it's an emergency, but. No, I mean, that's that's good, Jennifer, because I think in our line of work, right, especially when we're doing with people constantly, that reset button needs to happen. Um, I could totally relate on what you're saying, you know, even if it's just a five minutes or 15 minutes in between clients, it does make a difference right? and it matters. <laughs> yes. It's like, I need that, you know? Um, yeah. It's funny that I was just... Um, I was just nodding my head when you were saying that because if I would teach a class back to back, back to back, it's almost like I would shut the fitness door room and I'm like, I'm not letting anyone in. I need my time. No one gets in here, you know, for at least 10 to 15 minutes because I need my time. I need to have a quiet time really and focus my head. And then so I could be ready for the people that are coming in. So, um, you know, and you know, no offense to people that are in early. It's just that for us, for us to be able to give more, we have to gain ourselves back because it's something that important to um, people or the frontliners or, or the workers that deal with people constantly. So I appreciate that, Jennifer. And I was, I'm glad you said 
outdoors because I know you love hikes. You're in different area all the time. So <laughs> and nature is so healing. There's an immense amount of wisdom in what nature can do to make us feel better. Mm -hmm. I can't emphasize that enough in regards to all the self-care stuff. First, you know, get yeah. outside people, go yeah. do something, <laughs> breathe fresh air. Yeah. Um, so as we get close, um, wrapping up here, I think my, the main question I want to ask is, does everyone need to get therapy? So twofold question does everyone need to get therapy, one? And two, what can we do for people out there that says, well, Fitz, that's, that sounds nice and good, but I mean, therapy is financially expensive and it could be really, it, not everyone could really just afford it, right? So what can you tell our listeners out there that they can do in relates of getting the same amount of somehow an intervention with themselves to actually um, have the benefit that they could do when, dealing with anxiety. It's funny. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. Hmm. I, I don't think everybody needs therapy, but I do think that everybody should have a mental health provider in the same way that you have a primary care physician. Hmm. So somebody that you can reach out to in times of need. I think there's an immense amount of benefit of knowing that there's somebody in your world whose opinions you trust, <clears throat> who is a safe place that you can go to when you need to talk about something. So I think, and I hope that, especially with this pandemic, I've seen a huge influx in people seeking mental health services for obvious reasons, but I think also because little by little people are really starting to get more open to the idea that therapy is not just for quote unquote crazy people, that it can be for regular everyday people who are just having a tough go at it with their marriage or aren't taking to parenthood as well as they thought they would or hate their job or any number of things like trauma, et cetera. And so I'd like to think that we will eventually as a society move into a place where people will have a primary mental health care provider um, and the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that there were some legal actions that took place, I want to say within the last five to 10 years that made it legally required for met for insurance companies to cover mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. And so most people have mental health coverage through their insurance. Mm -hmm. Now, some insurances have managed to sidestep this by saying, yeah, you have mental health coverage after you've met your $3,000 deductible, <laughs> yeah. um, which is a real bummer. And I would encourage people in those situations to explore what's called HSA plans, which is like cash money that's set aside for things like co-pays and meeting your deductibles so that you can try to get the care that you need. But I've talked to so many people that don't realize that this is a covered benefit through your medical insurance. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to find a provider, I genuinely suggest you start there. Mm -hmm. Start with your insurance company. You can call them or most insurance companies nowadays have what's called a patient portal where you can log on and you can search for a mental health provider in your well, in your area is relative right now because most people are doing telehealth sessions, but who's at least in your network. Yeah. You can then cross-reference that by checking online. You'll get like a list of people who are in network. You can even identify people based on specific preferences, whether that's someone who specializes in anxiety or someone who's LGBTQIA affirmative or someone who works with racial or ethnic minorities or religious specific. You can search through filters and then you can go online and you can usually find that person's got a website somewhere, whether it's a listing through psychologytoday.com or a LinkedIn site or just their own private website. And you can learn about the clinicians that way. So you're not just cold calling random people based on the, like, whether their name sounds cool. <laughs> A lot of people yeah. find me that way. They're like, I found you online through my insurance. And then I saw your psychology today. And I love that you have X, Y, and Z specialties. I'd really like to work with you. So on and so forth. Yeah. So yeah. those are the, those are my, my go-to. There's also this other benefit that most employers offer called EAP. 
which stands for Employees Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. And that will usually provide at no cost somewhere between three to seven free therapy sessions. Yeah. yeah um, so yeah, I encourage people. across that, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so that's another way. I know. I'm glad that you touched, um, you tap into the negative connotation of therapy because a lot of times, I mean, I am guilty of it. I thought therapy was for if I have a severe issue, you know, like growing up, I didn't have it. So it's something that I have that negative connotation about it. But now that I am in one, we both go in, like my husband and I go in one, it's almost like, why didn't I start this? Like when I was 10, you know, like, <laughs> cause it's just so healthy. It just makes you more grounded. And, you know, um, you know, quick question, Jennifer, can your therapy be your friend? Because people are wondering about that too. Can your therapy be your friend? Yeah. Like as far as like if if you're if you have a friend that is a therapist, can oh, you would no. that okay. <laughs> good. And and I'll explain why is because being somebody's therapist is a privilege and an honor, but it's not always easy, yeah. so to speak. And sometimes as a clinician, it's my responsibility to point out something to somebody they don't want to hear. Yep. And that's not always great for friendships, mm -hmm. you know? Point. Yeah. So there's some ethical boundaries that, I mean, you can, you can be friendly with somebody who was a client of yours, but to maintain, those are called dual relationships. Yeah. To maintain a dual relationship where you're like, oh, my best friend is my therapist. If yeah. that's like, I mean, people say that you know, colloquially speaking, but if that, that you're actually paying your friend to be your therapist, then you're probably not getting the most ethical treatment because you have all these conflicting things going on. Like, well, I don't want to say this because we're supposed to go shopping tomorrow. And if she's mad at me, then we're not going to get to go shopping. And so it just creates weird boundaries. I so agree. Yeah. I so agree with that. Um, Sam, do you have any other pressing questions before we close out here? I feel like I'm I'm in a session right now. I <laughs> so much. No, it's I think for me, I've like my family history, you know, on both sides of the family, we've got, you know, different mental health things going on. And I I like that you spoke to the connotation that it's good to have at least the provider, because it's not just for crazy people. Like it's very real that I mean, most people feel better after just sharing anything with a close friend and then you take that to the level like you're saying here with an actual professional the amount of relief that that can give to people no matter how in their mind small the situation is huge so um, I like that you shared that and it's it's definitely something that you know I've considered for myself and just maintaining mental health and I think that <laughs> definitely after hearing from you and, and, and talking with Fitz as well, it's definitely something I want to explore for myself, but um, no, I just think that it's important for people to know that it is normal, mm -hmm. especially with everything going on now. And it's probably a lot easier, like you were saying with zoom and phone calls and everything that we have. So like, don't be afraid to like, you're not crazy. If you think you might need to speak to someone, I think is the takeaway that I'm getting there. Yeah. And I do want to add, because I hear this a lot from people who I end up seeing therapists are human too. Mm -hmm. And just like in any other career, some people are really good at what they do and some people aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I've had people come across my way who said like, I just had the worst experience with a therapist and I never wanted to see a therapist again, or I have trauma from an experience sure. I had with a therapist. And I want to be very compassionate and letting people know that that's all, I mean, not the trauma thing, that's extreme, but to have a not so great experience with a therapist doesn't mean that therapy isn't for you. It just means that therapist wasn't for you. And you're mm -hmm. always encouraged to have a little, like quick little consult session with somebody to see if that's a good fit. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to keep looking. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. this is a serious thing. Having a therapist is an intimate relationship, mm -hmm. you know? And so if you don't get along well with your therapist, if you don't much care for them, it's not going to work very well. You mm -hmm. have to like your therapist. You have to mm -hmm. think that there's somebody you have faith in, that you trust, that you think is competent and understanding of your situation. Mm -hmm. So I really want to encourage people, um, you guys, the listeners, and anybody you talk to, 
to just know that it's a search. It's a bit of a process. It's not easy, but once you find that right fit, then hopefully it will be really worth it. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, last thing, I want to give the floor to you, an open floor on what you really wanted to say to our audience, you know, coming from your heart and what you do and, and um, also how they can get a hold of you and where they can contact you, so. I want to say that it's okay to not be okay. Hmm. Times are really hard right now. And if you are not okay, that's all right. And there's a lot of help out there. And you're not crazy for feeling like you're having a hard time. And that it takes an immense amount of courage and bravery to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And that's a very respectable thing to do. As far as reaching me goes, I am on psychologytoday.com. So if you go on that website and Google search Jennifer Cohen in Long Beach, California, you will find my website through there. But if you also just Google Jennifer Cohen in Long Beach, California, you're likely to come across my psychology today, my LinkedIn, my website, maybe even my yoga therapy listing on the IYT website. So um, yeah, there's not many Jennifer Cohen clinicians in Long Beach. So as long as you have the Long Beach, California <laughs> bit in there, you're likely to come across me. Are you sure, Jen? There's no picture of us clubbing together there that, you know. <laughs> Thank like... goodness. This was well before cell phones had cameras. That's how <laughs> long you and I have known each other. <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, oh, okay. Like she just said it. I don't know. Don't Google my name, guys. <laughs> oh, I don't think we have any pictures together from. Yeah, I don't think so. We were good, <laughs> quote unquote. But Jennifer, thank you so much for your time. We really Absolutely. appreciate it. And it's very enlightening of what you said. And I'll let Sam um, do the honor of where they can contact us. Absolutely. We are constantly growing and expanding where people can locate us. But we are on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter now mm -hmm. at Enroute to Success 365. And of course, on LinkedIn individually at Sam Boyer or at Fitz DeSanto, and then directly at our email, alohafitzsam at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out there. Give us any topics that you guys would love to hear, any love, or definitely at this point, connect with Jennifer because I feel she has a lot of wisdom to share. <laughs> Just, I read through her website alone and I was, felt like I was learning a lot, so those are the places to contact us. And from my side, again, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time today. Oh, it's a privilege. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I want to give a quick shout out to Tori Williams, Katie Cude, my cousin Hazel, Kelly Curtis, Brandon Peasel, and Carrie Vagavinazari. Oh my God, I have to. I usually just call her Carrie V because her <laughs> last name is very complex. But Carrie, thank you for listening and giving us all the insights. I mean, our list has been growing and growing. And thank you for sharing us to your friends and family. We really appreciate it. We want to reach as many people as we can and share the love and inspiration to each and everyone that could use it. Um, Jennifer, we always end with what are the things we're grateful for. So today I'm grateful for Jennifer mm. being a good friend. It's been a long friendship here and I'm really glad you're here with us today. Sam, what's yours? Believe it or not, I am thankful for my coffee because it did not give me anxiety today. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you haven't because you haven't slept. So that's why. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah. Jennifer, how about you? I'm grateful for you guys and opportunities like this. I'm grateful for you guys hosting this podcast and for you guys taking the risky step to have somebody come on and talk about mental health. Very nice. Beautiful. Thank you, Jennifer. And remember, guys, even small victory is worth worth to be grateful for. We'll talk to you guys soon and look out for a future episode. Take care. <laughs>